With the M tax that's becoming pretty hefty these days and is continuing to rise, is it really worth paying all that extra money for the M car when there's really not that many differences? Should you just save a bunch of money and get a non-M? I've had my E36 M3 for a little over three years at this point, and during that time, I've really fallen in love with owning and driving the E36 chassis. I really can't tell you how much I've just enjoyed owning this car compared to any other car that I've owned before. If you're someone that owns an older classic BMW or is looking into buying one, anything from an E30 to an E34, E36, E28, E46, whatever, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell because we like that kind of stuff here. One thing that I commonly think about though, especially after driving other E36s that aren't M3s is, was it worth the price that I paid for the M3? Or should I have just bought a 325 or a 328 or something else instead? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Like I said, I've loved owning an M3. First of all, just the looks. Man, there's a reason why people who don't have M3s buy a lot of the M3 parts to put on the car. Everything from the bumpers to the mirrors to the vents on the hood that I love to the Vaders on the inside, just to name a few. Today, you know, really after giving this a lot of thought, I wanna tell you why you might want to consider skipping the M3 entirely and just buying an E36 that's a non-M and saving yourself a lot of money while still being able to enjoy the car just as much. I think it's pretty important for us to understand what the differences are between an M E36 and a non-M. There are actually not as many differences as you might think but it's good to understand what you'd be getting if you spent the extra money for the M or what you might be sacrificing or what might be worth sacrificing if you don't. I think it makes sense just to start from the exterior first. Like I mentioned before, the front bumper. A couple cool features about the front bumper are these awesome little brake ducts on each side next to the fog lights that funnel air over to your brakes to cool them off. Then we move up to the hood. One of my favorite parts about this car, like I mentioned a moment ago, are these super cool vents along the back that just have that really retro look that fits with the time period of the E36. Moving along down the car even further, we have the M side mirrors. These things are awesome. Look at this cool shape. And even today, the new M cars kind of have an evolution of these mirrors still. Next thing on the trim on the side of the car, there's obviously the M badges right here that look great as well. Going along to the bottom of the car along the side, we have the M side skirts. And then continuing down to the back end, really the only difference on the back that I've been able to come up with is just the back bumper, this cool little diffuser along the bottom. And that's pretty much it besides the, the rest of the M badges throughout. All that stuff that I mentioned, if you really haven't figured it out at that point, is pretty easy to get if you just wanted your car to look this way but not pay the M tax, which can be pretty hefty these days. There's a lot of companies that make aftermarket parts that can be way cheaper than buying the OEM ones if you can even find them. It's really not as much as you would think to turn the outside of an E36 into an M if you own a 325 or a 328 or something else. Moving on to the interior. So on the inside of the car, the first thing that I think is the most iconic are these sweet Vader seats. Not all M's have these Vader seats, but the coupes do. The leather has the M stripes in the front and the back. And even though they don't hold you in the best, they're a lot sportier looking than the alternates. And besides the little spots in the car, like you'll see in the dash that has an M on it and things like that, there's really one other big difference that I notice between an M and a non M E36, and that's just the steering wheel. Besides that, there's really not much to it. Now that we're about to get to the underside of the car, like the suspension, chassis details, and the engine and transmission, I think it's important for me to mention that I'm primarily talking about US spec E36 M3s at this point. There's even more differences with the uh, European spec M3s when you compare those to non-M cars. <laughs> So a major point of controversy with the E36 M3 that for the United States is the engine, the S52 B32 or the S50 B30 US. These engines are more similar to the engine that comes in a 328 than they are similar to the European M3s. Honestly, the S52 is basically just a souped up M52 and it's not really its own bespoke engine as you might be able to say more closely to the Euro M3. Specifically comparing to a 328, instead of having close to around 200 horsepower and 200 foot pounds of torque, give or take, you have 240. So it is enough of a difference that you can feel it, but it's honestly not massive. Now, don't get me wrong either, when I've driven an E36 328 and an M3 back to back, 
there's a very noticeable difference, especially in the torque. So it's there, but it's just not massive. Moving back to the transmission, whether or not you have an M or a non-ME36, you can get a five-speed manual or an automatic in it. Not that big of a deal there. When you go to the rear end, and one of the big reasons why I kind of wanted to buy an M in the first place was that E36 M3s come with a limited slip differential that allows you to do fun things like this. <laughs> Now the limited slip differential in the E36 M3 is a pretty good LSD, but it's not ideal if you're buying the car for a drift car. So if you're gonna be using it for drifting, don't even really consider that because you're gonna wanna upgrade the diff or weld it anyways. The lockup on that thing is only 25%. If I was gonna turn this into a drift car or drift it primarily, I'd either weld the diff or pay more money than I want to to upgrade it. Okay, so I think we pretty much have the drivetrain covered. Now let's just run over the suspension bits real quick. It's a common issue on E36s, even E46s, that where the rear subframe mounts up, it can crack the body and tear those mounts right out. The M3s already have the reinforcement plates welded in, so that's just one less thing you have to do if you're gonna be driving the car hard, because it's really something that you should consider, especially if you're gonna be upgrading the suspension. Speaking of suspension, that's really obviously another difference between non-M and M E36s. Everything from the M badge on their rear trailing arms that I honestly don't know if there's any other difference in these besides just the M badge, just to the shocks and the springs and the tuning to make that an M. Now, I hope I'm not missing anything, but you can obviously tell that when it comes to the suspension at least, there's really not a ton of differences. And if you wanted, again, to turn a non-M into an M by swapping those parts over, it'd be super simple and it's all like Legos. What made me really start thinking about this was the first time that I drove a 328i. And to be honest, I drove an M3 before any other E36, so the M3 was kind of my first experience. When I drove the 328, obviously it felt remarkably similar. This one was modified and had coilovers and other really good suspension parts so it handled a lot like an M3. I honestly couldn't tell the difference. The only difference that I could really tell was just in the, uh, in the power, in the engine. And like I said, it, it wasn't huge, but it was enough that I could certainly notice it. After driving the 328, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, like these cars are so similar. This, you could buy this 328 for like five grand. Right now, if you wanted to get a low mileage M3 like mine, you're gonna be paying in the high teens, even into the low 20s for something like this. And that's just ridiculous. You can obviously do everything that you need to do with all of the looks and the suspension to turn a non-M into an M for way less than the cost that it takes to the price of entry really into an M3. Where it begins to make even less sense to get an M3 is if you're going to highly modify it because you're swapping out all these parts anyways. You'd be taking out some of the M parts to put in aftermarket parts. You'd be taking out some of the non-M parts if you own a non-ME36 to put in aftermarket parts. And so it's kind of a wash at that point. Really the only circumstance that I can see where it would make sense to actually start with an M3 in a situation like that is obviously if you have the money to burn or if you just want to be able to start with a platform that takes less modification to where you want to get it to be just because of things like the engine starting with more power and torque. In fact, probably by the time that you did all the modifications that you would need to turn an E36 into something like a track car, really the only thing that would be a a noticeable differentiation between a non-M and an M at that point is just gonna be the engine. After I did drive that 328, I thought, man, it actually made me really wanna buy one. I really wanted to buy a 328 and have two E36s, which doesn't make a ton of sense, but you know. It was really just as fun to drive. It was just as fun to take turns and rip around in. And I honestly think that no matter what E36 you go for, or what trim or what platform that you end up buying, it's gonna be really easy for you to have a good time. The truth is all of these cars were built with really great bones. There's a reason why a ton of them are used for track cars. There's a reason why they're becoming even more and more popular for drift cars. They just have such a strong chassis. It's such a great foundation to build off of and the engines can take a ton of abuse. The last thing and potentially the most important thing that we really need to go over the details of is gonna be the price because obviously that's the biggest argument here. It's the money that you'd be saving going with a non-M or the money that you'd be spending going with an M. All kinds of BMW rear wheel drive manual transmission sports cars have been going way up in price recently. Everything from the newer 1M all the way down to the E46 M3s, E36 M3s, just even non-M E36s, especially E30s. 
Since we're talking about E36s specifically in this video, if you do a search on Auto Tempest right now for low mileage E36 M3s, like things under 100,000 miles, you're gonna see prices in the high teens to low to even mid 20s or higher. If you get down to like 30 or 50,000 miles, they can go for 25, 30 grand plus. That's a lot for a car from the 90s. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think the driving experience is very much worth it when you compare to other cars that you can get for that price. There's just something so special about these old BMWs that makes the value go up. If you get into E36 M3s that are over 100,000 miles, like 120, 150, 180, 200,000 miles, they kind of all blur together at that point. I've seen 200,000 mile E36 M3s sell for $16,000, $10,000. It's kind of a, a pretty wide range, but it's still a lot more than you can expect in most other cars from that same era. So there's certainly even on the higher mileage M3s is still an M-Tax. Don't let the high mileage scare you though, because these things last forever if they're well maintained. It's, you get one that's got a great maintenance history and it doesn't have a lot of deferred maintenance, there's no reason why you shouldn't buy a high mileage E36 M3, or any E36 for that matter. Now, if we contrast that with a 325 or 328, 323, other E36s, they are less than half the price with the same mileage. So there's a lot of money to be saved there. If you're considering a $20,000 E36 M3 or a $15,000 E36 M3, to get an E36 for five to $10,000, that leaves you a lot more cash to spend modifying the car and making it the way that you want it instead of spending all that just on the car the way that you buy it. Well, let's be honest, we all buy these cars and want to make them our own anyways. At least I would say 80% of us want to modify these things and we're not going to leave them stock. So I think that not buying an ME36, skipping that entirely to a non-M makes a lot of sense for most of us. So next time you're looking into purchasing an E36 or you're doing your research, just consider all the things that we talked about today. Consider if you're gonna modify it. Consider if you just wanna leave it stock. Consider how important it is or not important it is for you to have the most power right off the bat. Or consider if you really don't wanna do any work at all. If you just wanna buy the car and leave it that the way that it is and you want the most performance, those are the people that I think should buy the M's. All this talk might make you think that I regret buying an M car. So do I regret buying my E36 M3? Heck no. This thing is a beast and I love it. So for those of you who already own an E36, and for those of you who don't own an E36, and you're looking into buying one, I hope that you really enjoyed today's video and that you found it informative and insightful. If you liked today's video, give it a big thumbs up, and if you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button as well as the notification bell, of course, so that you don't miss an episode, and I'll see you guys in the next one.